Hey, it's Benji Cole, son of Al Cole from CBS Radio and host of the syndicated talk show, People of Distinction. The talk that gives you an in-depth view of some of the most dynamic, intelligent, and successful people on the planet. Run to our website, alcoholenterprises.com, for more info. Email me at benji at alcoholenterprises.com if you'd like to get involved with what we have going. And as always, please continue to like and follow our broadcast because People of Distinction is a nationally and internationally syndicated show because of listeners like you. Our shows are available across all major podcast distributors as well as YouTube. And if you keep following, we're going to continue to put out the content. We appreciate the support. Continue to like and follow and sit back and strap in because on the line with us today, we have the impressive Dr. Jeffrey Snyder. We're going to be discussing his book, Dirt Bags and Dead Bodies. Available for purchase through Amazon as well as barnesandnoble.com. Head on over there today, pick up your copies, and I'm going to tell you why you need to do that in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I want to take this opportunity and point out that Dr. Snyder was brought to our network today by author Reputation Press. So for my writers out there who have written their masterpiece and now you need help moving the book you just developed. If that's you, contact ARP. This is what they specialize in. So head on over to AuthorReputationPress.com today and gather all the ways that their fantastic team is going to help move your creative endeavors. And listen, people, it is an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Snyder here on the line. His book, Dirt Bags and Dead Bodies, is much more than a catchy title. I mean, listen, this is something special you're going to want to add to your shelf. It's all about his experience in the law enforcement industry and his years of service. All of these stories are based upon true events. It's graphic. It's intense. It is a non-stop page turner. It's going to make you feel like you are in that SWAT car with him going through these different cases and understanding truly what these law enforcement representatives go through on a day-to-day basis and how they place their lives on the line each and every day. And listen, at the end of it, don't take my word for it. Take Dr. Snyder's. It's his book. He's written it. It's his life. He's lived it. He's going to be able to articulate it much better than I ever could. Dr. Snyder, first and foremost, welcome to People of Distinction, and thank you very much for being a guest. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great, and thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Listen, Dr. Snyder, this is a true pleasure. I know that this is a memoir of sorts because it's going to give your background, but let's, outside of being a law enforcement agent, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Who is Dr. Jeffrey Snyder? Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm an Air Force Vietnam veteran, proud that I served my country. Yeah. I grew up in a very blue-collar family, a wonderful childhood, played football, high school, one year of college. And then after I came back from overseas during the Vietnam War, then that's when I entered law enforcement. But then I, after uh, 12 years in law enforcement, I went into investment banking and spent about 25 years there. Uh, I had the good fortune of earning my PhD in business. And so for the last 15 years, uh, I've been teaching online as an adjunct professor for four different universities. And the inspiration to write this book came from my wife and my four sons. Uh, Actually, my wife is the one that created the title of the book. She's a retired paramedic. So she already had some insight as, you know, at what I went through in those 12 years. So I thank her for that. And, you know, and I appreciate your comment that it's a catchy title and we were hoping that would, you know, catch the eye of many readers, but it's the content. And, you know, my entire intent wasn't to write the book to get rich, uh, but really I wanted the public to have an insight as to what it's really like being a police officer the lack of respect at times and Mm -hmm. the number of times that you put your life on the line and, uh, and then you, you go home and it's, you have to unwind. You just have to, for me, um, all the years I worked homicide and then the autopsies I had to witness, sometimes they were 18 month old children. 
and so you go home and you just have to find a way to unwind and and divorce yourself from you know all the trauma that you've just seen yeah and that's what i want the public to understand is um how police officers balance those traumatic events while they're on duty with going home and you know less trauma and more tranquil lifestyle i so i just wanted the public and especially in today when there's unfortunately so much disrespect for police officers and and even first responders mm-hmm. uh, but i was hoping that people would read it and say wow and, and i've actually had some uh, reviews where readers have said, I, I just, I didn't realize that police officers go through that, that you faced with those having to make those kind of decisions. And so that was my intent uh, in writing the book. You know, Dr. Snyder, thank you very much for articulating that. And listen, man, I'm, You know, I'm right there with you for a number of reasons here. The perception and the disrespect that law enforcement representatives receive. Now, people, let's just make sure I'm going to be fair to both sides. I understand that there are some bad apples out there within the law enforcement industry. But here's the other side to that coin. People, not all cops are bad and not all citizens are good. So there's a lot of areas of gray. I also agree, and my wife will definitely be the first to say this. (laughs) But this that old adage, behind every great man is an even greater woman. So you talk about her influence and your wife pushing you in this direction. And that title, I agree, man. It's 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 a your book is a literary version of like the first 48, which is, you know, something that is very popular in mainstream in these crime documentaries that we see now. This is something that has a lot of appeal. And your wife sounds like a magnificent woman and being able to recognize that. And that title stops you in your tracks and makes you want to look further. So I'm here for all of it. Let's jump into the book a little bit because I know it's going to showcase experiences that you've had. Without going into too much detail here, Dr. Snyder, can you go into maybe one or two individual cases that you discuss in the book to give us a little bit more of insight on what to expect, please? Well, the the ones that always, in a sense, haunt me um, are the the uh, child abuse cases, right? Where you know the child winds up being dead. And, uh, and, you know, some of the stories I talk about in there, they're not, they're child abuse cases. There's a couple of them where, you know, the child never made it. And, um, but, but you have to look at the circumstances, you know, how how can a parent do that to this child? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the youngest one that I investigated that, uh, the child was, I, I recall, was about four months old. The mother, 16-year-old, uh, parents pushed her out of their house. They wanted nothing to do with her, and they put her in an apartment by herself. And, you know, she's 16. She doesn't, I mean, she's just not worldly, if you will, mm-hmm. at all. She, you know, she didn't have the maturity to really take care of a, a newborn baby, and she wound up slamming it against the wall, breaking the brain stem, and obviously the child died immediately. I mean, that you know, that was a very tough situation because, you know, yes, you have to enforce the law. You know, it wasn't premeditated murder. You know, it was really more like manslaughter. But at the same time, you know, police officers are human beings. We we have feelings like anyone else. And, you know, I looked at this girl, and she didn't have a clue what she had done. So, you know, we never wound up charging her with manslaughter. I don't remember the specific charge, but um, the 
what we did that was most helpful was we got her some psychiatric help. Mm. Um, and, you know, she spent some time on probation. But that was just a case where, you know, you, you, you look at the this young girl and say, well, how could she do that? Well, she didn't, she didn't know how to care for the child. And so there are a lot of cases like that that police officers go through. And I investigated, you know, well, at one point, I I was head of the juvenile investigations unit in Lakewood, Colorado, and worked a lot of horrific um, child abuse cases, and some of them I wrote about in, in the book. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that probably stand out the most to me. Uh, you know, and being a father of five, uh, you just have a lot of passion for these children that, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you look at the parents and, and again, there's another story in the book that, I mean, I just looked at the mother who just beat her nine-year-old child with a leather horse strap. And she was talking about, oh, well, he didn't, he just didn't allow me to, to beat him with the strap. I'm like, you know, and I said it this way. I said, no shit, lady. Yeah, right. Well, what if I if I stripped you down naked and you knew I was going to beat you with this horse strap, would you just stand there and let me do it? And she just stood there with the most dumbfounded look on her face. And, you know, that one, to be honest, I, I took great pleasure in, in arresting her and charging her with felony child abuse mm-hmm. so well you know listen dr snyder as a parent myself i get it i'm right there with you man i i completely agree people again it's amazon it's barnes and noble it's called dirt bags and dead bodies by dr jeffrey snyder head on over there today pick up your copies we have barely scratched the surface we've talked about two individual cases the book is littered with so many i want to go here next when it comes to your training Talk to us a little bit more on the training that law enforcement representatives go through. They do, um, and and it's much better today than, you know, when I was a police officer. Um, There's a lot more in, say, the basic training and and then the ongoing training of, you know, how do you deal with uh, people who are having uh, an emotional episode? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know they're beyond reason, um, but if I may, I've been an advocate um, that um, that law enforcement people should have to go through an emotional intelligence assessment, mm. and not necessarily for hiring purposes, but the you know I studied uh, emotional intelligence and leadership at Cornell University a couple of years ago. And and I'm, I, I've become even a more advocate that, you know, it has great value. And, and the value is that when a police officer gets insight, has an understanding of their own emotional intelligence, in other words, you know, what kind of biases do I have? Um, am I seeing things, you know, different than most people in that? It, it's very insightful for them, and it allows them to say, you know, I, okay, I need to make some changes so that next time if I get confronted, like I'm at a domestic violence call, which, by the way, one of the most dangerous calls you can go on, now they're of their own self-awareness, they can avoid some of the biases. Uh, I, I know for years, um, one of the prevailing biases in, in going to a domestic violence call is, was that, you know, it's always the male. It's always the man. I mean, and usually if they took anyone to jail, it was normally the man. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not true today. 
uh, because experience has shown that women can be just a bit as abusive as, as a man can. And, but the, but when an officer has this self-awareness because they've taken this emotional intelligence assessment, it really helps them. It, it just does, uh, that they get now get to understand, okay, I'm going to this domestic violence call. You know, I have to keep my own biases out. Yeah. I have to be neutral. You know, I just have to be neutral. And a lot of times it's he says, she says, and you wind up being more of a, a referee, a mediator uh, than, than an enforcement officer. So those social skills, which is a part of the assessment of emotional intelligence, those are important mm -hmm. because, you know, you, you have to be able to relate to both people who are pissed off at each other. And you, you just, you have to negotiate, you have to mediate, as opposed to, you know, in decades ago, they would just take somebody that was the solution. One of them just take somebody off the jail. That way, they're separated, and that and that's not true today. That's that's not the best resolution. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's again, it's mediating a situation, and sometimes you're able to get somebody to to leave, and that. Um, but I I still advocate that. Emotional intelligence assessments should be part of the training for police officers. Yeah. So, thank uh, you. That's my soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Snyder, thank you very much for articulating that, man. You listen, it's only fair. If I asked about advice that you had for just law enforcement representatives, well, now I'm going to ask for advice for the general public here. I guess, you know, a, a clean and easy way to ask this is, in your opinion, what can the general public do when they are, when they're dealing with law enforcement representatives to not escalate situations further than where they need to go? I mean, of course, I guess the generic one is, listen, just be respectful, be patient. We understand given certain circumstances and things that may happen, that's you know, maybe difficult to do at times, but from your perception, what can we do to better assist in any investigation that is happening with law enforcement representatives involvement? Well, first of all, and then, you know, when you had mentioned 48 hours, my wife loves that, that show. <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't watch it because when I do, and I, I'm constantly critiquing, you know, no, 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 you got to go talk to this guy. Right. <laughs> no, why are you doing that? You know, so uh, I don't watch it, but my wife does. But uh, but if you watch like cops, you know, the number one thing I, and, and I told my sons as they were growing up, same message, do what the police officer tells you to do. If you think it's wrong, you can do you, you know you can do take action later. File an internal complaint, sue them, whatever. But at that moment, there's a reason that officer's telling you, you know, throw your keys out the car, stick your hands out the window, uh, open the door from the outside, and there's just very logical reasons a lot of times and people want, they don't follow what the officer is telling them to do. And those are the circumstances very often then that they get involved in a resisting arrest. Yeah. And it's like, why? If you just followed what the officer told you to do, if you don't like it, you can file a complaint later. It, this other part that I would say to the public is, don't be quick to make a judgment. Wait until all the information is there. I, I see, you know, in some of these circumstances where there's the, the 
you know, mainstream media is talking about, oh, look, look at how abusive this officer was. Um, and it's no, no, wait until you understand and you get all the facts and then make your judgment. Right. But the media is, they're, they're just flagrant when it comes to uh, misinterpreting, you know, the first set of information that comes out. Oh, oh, well, the officer wasn't justified. And then by the time you get all the rest of the information, then it turns out, yes, the officer was justified. Mm -hmm. But it's the old adage about you can't unring the bell. So when they ring that bell the first time and say, oh, the officer wasn't justified, there's always going to be an element of people out there that are still going to believe it. So right. I just say to the public, just wait and tell you, you know, don't make any judgments until all the information is put out and then, then you can say, ah, he was right, he was wrong. But, you know, the old adage about knee-jerk reactions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I see a lot of people in the public do. Uh, well, in the mainstream media, but but in my opinion, mainstream media, they do it on purpose. They want oh, yeah. sensationalism. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, unfortunately, they, they promote disrespect for police officers. Um, how many stories do you ever see on the on mainstream media about an officer saving someone's life? Right. Not very often, mm -hmm. although it happens every day. Police officers save somebody's life, but you never see it in in the media. You won't. But if the officer got in a fight in a resisting arrest and and it's say it's a male officer and a female suspect, and he punches her. Oh, wow! The media goes crazy over that. Yeah. And you know how abusive. Well, but the rest of the story was is that she had on high heel shoes, spike shoes, and she was kicking him in the chest. And it's like, and the officer he could have tasered her, he could have maced her, he could have done that. But at the moment, the only thing he could do or thought about doing was just punch her. And he did. And, and you know, and this guy had bruises all over his chest from her shoes. But the, the media and the public just, they just knee-jerk reaction. And so all I ever ask of the people is, Wait until you get the whole story, because a lot of times what you hear on the media is a, a, a distorted picture of what's really happened. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, you know, Dr. Snyder, again, it goes back to what I was saying uh, before and what has been reiterated a number of times throughout this interview is people, again, when it comes to what is being shown to the public, oftentimes it's coming in some way, either through like a social media post, it's coming from some individual news account. And always remember, their job is to gain views, right? It's propaganda. So oftentimes you're getting a snapshot of what is actually happening. And I get it. From a public standpoint, we take a 10-second clip of a 30-minute interaction and and now we are ready to judge the entirety of it, whether we're judging the individual civilian, we're judging the law enforcement representative, what have you. There are a lot of areas of gray. And if there is one thing that I'm taking from this interview, amongst so many things, it's to have that patience. I get it. People in the moment, it may not be as easy to do. 
But I'm hoping that through this discussion that we just had here on our network, and also when you head on over to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you pick up your copies of Dirt Bags and Dead Bodies, you're able to open your eyes to the individual circumstances on a, day- on a day-to-day basis that law enforcement representatives have to go through and be able to operate accordingly with the proper amount of empathy and patience in any situation that you're dealing with. Dr. Snyder, this has been a true pleasure, man, an absolute delight. I really do mean this. It has been a wonderful and enlightening discussion that you have brought to our network today. And I know my listening audience is going to be better because of it. So once again, thank you for being a guest on People of Distinction. I enjoyed the conversation and uh, and I appreciate the chance to be able to get this out to the public.